As we take this time to remember our Lord Jesus, I want to draw your attention a faithful saying. In 1 Timothy 1.15, that's the passage I'll be expounding on. And the faithful saying is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. This is what is said about that statement. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Again, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He starts off by declaring that's a faithful saying. Thing in reference, that's the thing, that's the thing that's faithful. Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners. And by calling it a faithful saying, he's declaring that it's a doctrine that is most certainly true, dependable, and reliable. It's something you can take to heart, something faith can take hold of and see as a reality and without any fear of it being a hoax or a fable. Not only that, he says it's worthy of all acceptation. Seeing that it is so true, reliable, and accurate, it would make sense to encourage all to embrace the saying and understand its meaning. All men have been declared under sin by the scripture. All are dead. All are damned. All are guilty. With these things being the case, it would make sense for all men to welcome a doctrine that shows them how to be pardoned from sin and saved from God's divine wrath and punishment. Some versions actually translate the passage to say, accepted universally. That does give an interesting pers perspective of the passage. It's something that all men are to accept. Now, all men are to see this and take this to heart. Now, there's also the, this is just kind of a lower view of the passage, but there's also that all acceptation is like completely, a complete acceptation. Don't like take it in partially. Don't like to be loose about it, but take full grasp on that. Let it, set, make, let it settle itself inside of you and dwell on that. Oh, it's worthy of all expectation. It's for sure an exhortation for all to acknowledge the truth that, that's declared in this saying. To get to the saying, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now, to many, I fear this statement is of little value. It's something that we constantly declare to one another as we gather together. You know, we frequently bring attention to the death of Christ here in the assembly. Yet how many have really considered the meaning of that saying? How many have accepted that saying and truly acknowledged that it's most certainly true? How many can really do that? Now, by experience, we can testify that the death of Christ is no small matter. It's not something to be casual about. And by doing that, we consider like what he gave us through his death. How did he save us? Now, Christ did give us life as a result of him dying. And the life that he gave us is by no means a temporal life, something that fades away. The life that Jesus gives us, it's not like the life that was given to Lazarus. You know, after being dead four days, he was brought back. But eventually, Lazarus would have to die again. That's not what salvation has done. It's not a temporary thing, a temporary happiness, a temporary acceptance. What Christ has given us has done a much greater, more powerful work. Now, on that note, I will say that Christ does not come to salvage sinners, nor did he come just to restore them to the state that man was in in the Garden of Eden. Now, such a view of salvation, pardon the crude example, that's like compared to the, a dead battery being recharged, so to speak. I mean, I mean, the battery lasts so long and finally just poof, it goes out. You put it in the charger, zap, zap, and now it's ready to use again, then it just falls down again. And so it goes over and over again, constantly running out of power and running out of power, having to recharge. This isn't what salvation is. So to get to the point, if you were just being brought back to Adam's state, it wouldn't be long before you were overtaken again because that state is not good enough. Even though Adam was at one time sinless, in, in the sense that he was innocent and had not yet committed a transgression, he was still capable of rebelling against God. So if God's going to save sinners, he has to do something different. Yeah. He has to make them something greater. He has to make them a new creation. Mm -hmm. So this would not be recreating Adam, but rather a creation of a new race mm -hmm. that has no connection to him at all. Christ is the one who begins this generation. All who come, from, come to him experience a new birth, making them a son, born of God, received by the Lord. Jesus was required to come into the world to accomplish this, with the salvation of sinners as his objective. When this mentions him coming into the world, it's for sure referencing his death, because that is what he came in the world to do, to save sinners, and that's like the means by which he did this. He died for them. The fact is, Jesus did have to die in order for your sins to be taken away. There was no other option. That's what was required for you to have that status, saved. 
If God's going to save us from God's wrath, then he has to do something that appeases God's wrath. His death is that thing. If God is angry with us, Christ has to do something that's able to make God pleased with us. The death is that thing. It shifts the focus of God's wrath off of you and onto him. I do not... I don't think many realize how devastating their former condition was. How many people that you know are really are ashamed of their past life? How many can say, I mean, just think about it. Like, how many people you know that, like, look on their past life and they're ashamed of it? They are devastated that they at one time lived the way that they did. When you see how dead and condemned you were, you appreciate the value of salvation all the more because then you see how deep of a pit you've been brought out of. Then you're able to speak about salvation the way, the way Paul speaks about it here. See, this is a man who's really seen what the blood of Jesus has done, what Jesus did. He's holding himself forth as an example. When Jesus died, he did suffer the penalty for all sin, not leaving one untouched. All sin has been dealt with. So what has the blood of Jesus done for you? What effects have come from this sacrifice? What happens when a person believes that Jesus Christ is God's only son and that he died for the sins of all? next part, I feel, shows us how powerful and great this salvation is. He says, save sinners of whom I am chief. That's how he describes himself. I believe Paul here puts himself forth as an example of what the blood of Jesus can do. Any believer who is truly saved will always be ready to admit that his past life has been evil. Now, Paul persecuted the church of God, just to show kind of what he's referring to here. Just give a couple references here. Acts chapter 9 Verse 1 and 2, speaking of him and his former name, Saul and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to synagogues, that if he found any in this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. This is who Paul was. I'm going to go a little further ahead here to chapter 22, when Paul gives his defense to the Jews, starting at verse 3, I am... I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye are all this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. This is, this is what Paul's experience was in his former life. Yet another one here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Last one I'll reference here is Galatians 1, 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Now that's the past life. And I believe it's for this reason he refers to himself as the chief of sinners, because of what he had done in his past life. It cannot mean that he was still in such a state. For if this were true, then surely this would put the lie to what he has just established. If he was still currently living in sin, still the worst sinner that ever existed, if that's true, still has that status, then what basis would there be for him declaring that this statement is faithful and worthy of acceptation? If he hasn't even experienced that change in Christ Jesus, like what's the basis? Like why would you move someone to take hold of that if you're still the worst of the worst, so to speak? That doesn't make any sense to me. On the contrary... I believe he's not emphasizing how sinful he is, but rather how much mercy that he has been shown. Paul, though he did persecute God's people, was shown a lot of mercy. Some of these verses I'm reading are going to be the next statements and ones that I've already read. I read 1 Corinthians 15, 9, saying he's the least of the apostles. He reads and says in verse 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am. That's a change. That's not, that's not the one what he's referring to before. And his grace which is bestowed on me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. That's all the apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Let's go back to Galatians now. Verse 13, he talked about his conversation times past. Verse 23 reads this. But they heard, had heard only that he, referring to himself, had per, which persecuted us in times past, now preaches the faith he once he destroyed. That's a big change. Now into this very chapter here that I'm referencing from, 1 Timothy 15, just one verse before and one verse after, verse 13 it says, he's speaking to himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief. And then the very next verse of verse 15, 16, saying, of whom I am chief, how be it, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern 
to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Amen. Indeed, a very real change took place in Paul yeah. that was noticed by those who were around him. Yeah. Hey, there's something different about Paul. Yeah. He's fighting us, and now he's, now he's speaking on our behalf. He's preaching the thing that he condemned. He's showing that salvation is so great and plenteous that he could even change the, church, the chief and worst sinner of all. Even men who fought against God could become his friends. Men who showed strong hostility toward the Lord's people could become one of their brethren in Christ Jesus. A person who is dead can be made alive forever. And I do realize a lot of people can take this passage to be speaking of how bad we are. But the passage, I believe, is speaking more of how great salvation is and how much we have changed as a result of the experience of it. No matter how wicked we were or how much wrong we had done, we can say at this table, I am no longer that thing due to Christ Jesus. I did do that, but I do not do that now. I am, we could say along with Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. And that thing that I am is not what you heard of before. That blasphemer, that injurious, harmful person, that's not me today. And we owe that change to Christ Jesus. Well, he's, the, he's brought that out. He's, I just, he's the chief of sinners. He said, Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners. And he puts himself forward. Look at me. Look at what he's done in me. To show just of how great this salvation really is. Since we have experienced this great salvation, we can say, as a result of that experience, that this is indeed a true, faithful saying, and it is truly worthy of our acceptance. Amen. And we do accept it, don't we? Amen. Let us now pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we always give thanks for what has been done through Christ Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we would honor Him in our thoughts and our actions. We pray, Lord, as we give this time to remember him, we pray that we would not dishonor, dishonor the Lord's table. We pray, Lord, that you would purify our thoughts, that there be nothing distracting us at this time. We pray in your son's name. Amen.